Okay, class, we are back again. Uh, this is the second of the lectures that I'm recording for you today. I think I'll break this one in two parts so that the files don't get too big to uh, manipulate. Uh, this is the economics of gas cooling, the second of the train uh, presentations that I handed you out. So you have a paper copy you can follow along with. Okay, there's the title. All right, so uh, the types of absorption uh, equipment that are addressed or considered uh, are the single effect indirect fired absorption. By indirect fired, we mean that there is some sort of a secondary piece of equipment, uh, typically a boiler uh, that is fired uh, uh, that produces steam or hot water that's used then to uh, drive the absorption cycle. Uh, also a two-stage indirect fired absorption unit and direct effect, or excuse me, double effect direct fired. So the double effect is the one that has the two stages of steam generation and direct fired means that uh, we are consuming natural gas, uh, i.e. the boiler or the the additional stage of steam generation is attached to the chiller. It's part of the, the chiller equipment. Single stage steam driven, uh, size wise, we are in the range of 1,000 to 1,600 tons uh, requirement. We can do it with hot water, the lowest being about 195. They would much prefer to see up in the range of 270 or low pressure steam, about 12 PSI G. Uh, the COP, the coefficient of performance, is rated here at 0.67, which means that for uh, every unit of heat input, you get about 0.67 units of cooling effect out of the machine. Uh, the steam consumption uh, at the 12 PSI G steam would be 18.7 uh, pounds uh, of steam per ton hour produced. The uh, direct fired unit would require uh, 0.24 therms of gas input energy per ton hour. And you guys may or may not know what a therm is. A therm is 100,000 BTUs. Uh, Natural gas is typically sold in units of MCF, which is 1,000 cubic foot of gas, and the nominal value of heat for a one cubic foot of gas is 1,000 BTUs. So an MCF would be 1,000, 1,000 in terms of BTUs or a million BTUs. Uh, so a therm being 100,000 BTUs, it takes 10 therms to make a million BTUs. So you guys should probably write that down and uh, you should memorize that a therm is uh, 100,000 BTUs and that one cubic foot of natural gas is nominally 1,000 BTUs. So the actual gas supplied uh, by utility company usually has a BTU factor. It might be a number like 1.03 or something that adjusts uh, because the, the metered unit is cubic feet, but then they have to use the multiplier to figure out exactly how many BTUs of energy uh, were supplied. So that 0.24 therms is 24,000 BTUs of natural gas are required uh, to be combusted to drive one ton of cooling, which is uh, 12,000 BTUs of cooling. All right. Uh, simply shows a very simplistic uh, diagram. So we're showing that we have a boiler right here, which is producing the low pressure steam that drives the absorption unit. We have our cooling tower over here which we supply into the absorber first and then into the condenser. So our design numbers were, were 85 in here, 95 here, and 103 here, back to the tower. And this shows our uh, uh, chilled water circuit. This is our chilled water. 
So we're coming back at maybe, I don't know, 54, coming out at 44, or 54, coming out at 42, whatever uh, the system's designed for. Okay, just a picture of a single stage uh, absorber. Uh, you could get online or whatever and find some additional ones. Good size machines. Okay, the two stage steam driven uh, absorber. Uh, the size is 1150 on the high side, down to 300 tons on the low side. Steam pressure is nominally 115 pounds here. Uh, which is far hotter, obviously, than the 12 pound steam. Uh, coefficient performance so we get 1.2 uh, units of cooling for every one uh, unit of input energy uh, into the chiller. So it, they're definitely much more efficient than uh, single stage machines. Um, you know, we require 9.7 tons per hour of uh i'm sorry pounds per hour to for each ton hour of uh, uh, refrigeration produced so this works out to be uh 12,500 btus of gas or it's 0.125 therms to produce uh, 12,000 btus of cooling which is a uh you know one uh ton hour a ton is 12,000 btus Per hour, if it goes on for one hour, that's 12,000 BTUs. Uh, this shows a similar diagram as before. Uh, we're showing a boiler, uh, which is the first stage of uh, steam. Well, is producing steam that goes into the first stage generator that then drives the second stage generator with the cooling tower, water, and the chill water circuit on that uh, just a picture it's a little more complicated okay oh this is the two-stage direct fired unit um, so the size on these is a, a high side 1100 tons down to uh, about a hundred pretty small uh, we can fuels typically it's natural gas we could use propane or number two fuel oil uh, these days in the U.S., the natural gas being fairly inexpensive, uh, which is probably be the preference. Propane pretty pretty expensive compared to natural gas most places. And number two, fuel oil is basically diesel uh, without the additives that they would put in for transportation fuel. Uh, these units can provide both uh, heating and cooling simultaneously. The CLP is 1.03, so we get 1.03 uh, units of cooling for every one unit of energy input. Uh, this turns out to be 11,600 BTUs of gas required for one uh, ton hour of cooling or 12,000 BTUs, and that's 0.116 therms of gas per ton hour produced. Uh, this shows a, uh, a simplified diagram of the direct fired system. So now the, the burner is basically a separate module that bolts right onto the side of the chiller as part of it. And then we show the other. We don't show the uh, hot water generation here, which we'll see in some subsequent uh, diagrams. A picture now, so you can see here. It looks like the direct effect machine before, but now here's where the, this is the natural gas burner. You can see the flame down here. So this is our uh, heat. This is what's producing the uh, steam to uh, drive the cycle. So it's like we have a little boiler strapped on the side, it comes with it. Operating cost, okay. So uh, let's take a look and see uh, what it costs to run each of these machines. Now we're going to assume uh, the natural gas rate is uh, 45 cents a therm. Uh, that would be $4.50. Uh, an MCF, which is 
a million BTUs. So it's this four dollar and fifty cent gas. Since we're doing the capital T here stands for therm. So uh, we're going to work in therms instead of MMBTUs, which is fine. So the uh, if we recall the uh, the gas requirement for the single stage was 0.24 therms per ton hour. So I'll now multiply that times my rate, 0.45 dollars per therm, and I get uh, uh, 0.108 dollars per ton hour. When I look at the uh, two stage, it was 0.125 therms per ton hour. So that comes out about. Uh, 5.6 cents per ton hour. The direct fire was even a little bit less, 0.116 therms per ton hour. So that's uh, 5.2 cents per ton hour. And the centrifugal, uh, we'll show this calculation in a minute, uh, works out to be uh, $4.8 dollars per ton hour. So the conclusion at this point in the analysis is you may not save money simply by moving BTUs uh, of cooling from electric to natural gas. So, because the centrifugal in, at this point could be cheaper. Uh, but the issue that we get into is the uh, rate structures and the on peak places that have very high demand charges for an on-peak period during the day versus off-peak period. It really skews the economics of the situation, as we'll see. Okay, so um, the, our goal here is to design an application that uses the direct fired absorber to reduce as much demand as economically possible. So we'll see how this works out here in just a second. Okay, so included in this economic analysis are uh, equipment first cost, uh, installed cost, operating cost, maintenance cost, total system cost, and specific load profiles for a typical build. And they're going to use the uh, trace uh, uh, software to model this. Okay, so, but we have to look at different ways that chiller plants get constructed first. And so we've got, I think, three slides here that look at three different uh, opportunities. So we're gonna have this uh, parallel flow, it's called a decoupled system. So uh, the system um, equally loads the chillers. The drawback, to this type of system for what we're trying to accomplish is that units cannot be preferentially loaded. Uh, once one of the units is loaded uh, above 100%, the second unit comes on and then they split the load 50-50, you're able to reduce demand some, but not as much as if we used uh, one of the other options. Okay, so let's take a look at the series flow, which means that over here we've got return water temperature from our cooling loop coming back at 58 degrees. We're going to go into this direct fired absorption unit. Now this is this would be a full load scenario, so we're going to drop eight degrees with this one, and then we're going to drop eight more degrees with this one. And this would be the electric centrifugal chiller here versus the um, direct fired absorber. Uh, so this arrangement solves some of the, the uh, problems on the first slide. This arrangement allows you to load either chiller so that you can take advantage of your electrical rate structure. Uh, you can put whatever load you want on either machine as you need to. Using the absorber upstream uh, has advantages in that when we put these this high, like this 58 degree chill water temperature uh, into the absorber, it makes it run more efficiently. So for example, if this was this absorber was rated at 500 tons at American Refrigeration Institute rating standard rating conditions, 
it can now produce 600 tons. You get an extra 100 tons of capacity by giving it um, uh, such high uh, inlet water temperature, which then allows it to have you know, fairly high leaving water temperature of 50 because we're going to polish it off later uh, with a centrifugal. So we get a 20% increase in capacity. Uh, one issue with this is that we're always pumping through both chillers, through both evaporators, and that's extra pressure loss on our pumps. So, you know, that's a requirement if you're going to pipe it into series flow. However, we have the side stream arrangement here, which is, I think, what's basically recommended. Um, so this arrangement can preferentially load um, the absorber uh, and has all the advantages of series arrangement without having to pump all of the water through all of the machines. So we don't have as much pressure drop to worry about. So this is what we're gonna use for our evaluation. Um, I will try to email you out a trained engineer's newsletter that uh, discusses this in depth and detail. Uh, I'll search for it here in just a little bit. Okay, so uh, electrical rates for Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's a little different than we've talked, but you know, similar in concept. So the energy charge, they actually have three periods of the day. So on peak, uh, it's 5.32 cents a kilowatt hour. Mid peak, it's 4.113 cents a kilowatt hour. And off peak, it's 2.739 cents per kilowatt hour. The on peak demand charge is 12.55 a kW. And then the max demand, which in general could be off peak, but for a chiller operation is almost always going to be on peak because the chiller uh, is what sets the peak uh, pretty much for most buildings. The other stuff not being so variable during the day, such as plug load and uh, lighting and, you know, uh, just uh, copier and general energy use. So the max demand charge is another uh, 1025. So in general, for this, we will add the 1255 and the 1025. What does that make? 2280 a kW for on-peak demand, which is pretty steep. Pretty steep. That's what drives the uh, favorable outcome of this analysis towards absorption. Okay, so this is just some kind of background information on a typical commercial type air conditioning building. So we say, well, if I look at the overall building, this first uh, little pie chart down here says that typically uh, for the overall building, the overall bill, about 50% of the cost comes from energy, KWH, and 50% comes from demand. Okay, but if I, since I'm doing an analysis on just the chiller plant, when you dig into the chiller plant, what you typically find is that the energy charge, the KWH represents 39% of the total uh, chiller plant bill. And that would be chiller, pumps, and cooling towers. Uh, and the demand charge represents 61%. So uh, the cost of operating a chill water plant is heavily dominated by demand charges. And that's what uh, go into this, what they call hybrid uh, chiller plant, where you have an absorption and a centrifugal units kind of working together, gives you some flexibility. That's th that mix addresses this fact that demand charge is typically high on the chiller plant. Uh, just some of the math that we'll use. Um, so if you take uh, 12,000 BTUs an hour is a 10 hour cooling and you divide by that by the COP and multiply by uh, just the conversion between BTUs to therms, you get therms per ton hour and then you multiply it by the cost per therm, therm and that gets you the cost per ton hour. So they're showing an example here. Um, and I think this is the direct fired machine. So we need point, 
1165 thermos per ton hour times 0.45, so that's 5.24 cents per ton hour of refrigeration. That's what it costs to produce a ton hour of refrigeration for this direct fired unit. Okay, now this is a little more subtle, I guess, on the electrical cost. They want to get this, you know, we have the demand charge and we have the consumption charge and we want to get this in terms of the cost per ton hour. And so uh, we can look at this for a minute. So the efficiency of this um, chiller they're starting out with is 0.6 kW per ton. So let's play with this and say, because a kW is uh, what uh, 3412 BTUs an hour. Okay, so if you take, do this on your calculator, take 3412 times 0.6, okay? And so that comes out 2048.4. I'm gonna store that away. I think I did. No, I didn't. I'll do it again. <laughs> two times one six equal to store one. Okay, I got it now. And take twelve thousand. Uh, take twelve thousand and divide it by that number, and that will give you your uh, COP. So because the twelve thousand would be the cooling effect, and the two thousand forty-eight it would be the energy input in the same units, and that's COP. So twelve thousand divided by 12,048, so that's 5.86. So the COP on this electrical machine is 5.86. So you ought to play around with that, just see if you can do it. Okay, so back to the demand cost. So it's 0.6 kW per ton, and it's uh, 2280 as a total demand charge. So that's gonna be uh, $13.60 uh, per ton, when you multiply that out, um, and then what they're going to do is they look at the operating time. So down at the bottom, you can read the print with me. Uh, the on-peak hours are 12 to 8, so that's 8 hours a day. And they're saying that we have typical work days are 23. 23 times 8 is 184. So they're saying that they're going to spread this demand charge out evenly over this uh, 184 hours. So if you take the uh, 13.6 divided by 184, you get the 7.39. So number. So that's cents per ton hour. So that's how they're going to handle the demand cost. And then for the energy charge, uh, it's just it's 0.6 kW per ton. And then there's the kWh charge. So it's it's uh, uh, that's dollar, so there's three dot three point one nine cents per ton hour. So you add those together, so the electrical cost is uh, ten point five eight cents per ton hour. So you need to study through there and make sure you've got that. That's uh, there's different ways of handling this, but but this is this is good. Okay, so then now we go through and you compare for our direct fire to centrifugal all of our periods of the day and we see that for the off-peak period oh my goodness well we want to run the centrifugal because it's 1.64 cents a ton hour versus 5.24 cents a ton hour so you would not want to run your direct fire absorption here uh, during the mid-peak again the centrifugal is up to 2.47 but still uh, it's about half of what it takes to operate the direct fire, so you wouldn't want to do this. But look at the on-peak. So now it's uh, the centrifugal is you know 10.58 versus 5.24, so it's roughly twice as exp expensive to uh, uh, during the summer peak and during the winter peak, uh, the centrifugal is slightly more expensive, so it really doesn't matter much. There's not much difference between these. But right here is the reason that these hybrid uh, plants uh, have perhaps decent economics. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop this one right here. I don't want these files to get too big. They uh, uh, become difficult 
to uh, manipulate. So I'll stop here and then I'll start another one here in just a minute. And so the rest of this presentation will be in the second uh, file posted on this one.